Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna give it just a few seconds for everyone to come in. There we go. Good I morning, love everybody. watching those numbers jump, I, I know. Thank you to everybody that's tuning in every week and all the new people that are joining us, Lauren and I are just watching those numbers go higher and higher and it's just such a wonderful feeling. As they grow, our smiles grow. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm sure the numbers will continue. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Let's see, and let's get this thing going. Okay, as everyone comes in, good morning to you. My name is Lauren Simpson. I'm with the SBDC or the Small Business Development Center. Thank you for joining us this morning. You have tuned in to Small Biz Talk, solutions for your small business with Miss Lori Williams. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Lauren, and good morning to everybody joining us. We're up for, we're in for a really great treat today. Lori has a fantastic interview that she has planned. But before we dive into that, I'd love to give you all some background as to who we are. And so again, my name is Lauren Simpson. I'm with the Small Business Development Center, or you may know the acronym uh, SBDC. And we are a national program with over a thousand locations across the country. That means that any state, any city you might be in, you should be able to uh, connect with a local office to assist you in your entrepreneurial needs. We offer no cost services for local small businesses. No cost, that's the operative phrase. <laughs> there are absolutely no costs when it comes to working with any of our business advisors or attending any of our trainings. And there are no costs because your tax dollars are, have already taken care of all of the fees. So they're your tax dollars at work. <laughs> For the Los Angeles Network, which is the network that I represent, uh, we have several locations, as you can see here on this uh, map. We go as far out as Camarillo and Santa Clarita over to Pasadena down to Long Beach. So again, anyone within this region should be able to connect with a local office. And just to be clear, so everyone knows what it is that we do, we offer no cost business advising. Uh, that means that you can connect with an advisor such as Lori, who's an expert when it comes to, I say all things money, all things numbers, uh, <laughs> to marketers, um, uh, to those who are specialists in um, social media. Again, anything that your business might need, our office can help. And we also offer virtual training. So trainings like the one you're attending today uh, is, are the types of programs that we offer. And again, we're here to help. So please contact us today. For the Los Angeles area, you can call us at 866-588-7232. Or you can connect with us online, smallbizla.org forward slash new client. For those of you who have um, gotten wind of this, um, this training and aren't in the Los Angeles area, type in americasbdc.org, find your SBDC, and you'll be able to connect with a local office that can help you. With that, I should pro let me go over a few uh, housekeeping rules. For those of you that are new, please be sure to enter all of your questions into our Q&A. Again, questions go into our Q&A because our chat is going to be reserved for uh, the party that tends to happen <laughs> when it comes to the conversations, as well as uh, feedback that uh, everyone has uh, for the presentation that's currently going on. But it's also for links that I'll be pasting in there. Uh, there'll be links that Lori's mentioning, um, links that um, will connect you to our offices. And I'll also provide a link for our YouTube channel that'll have all of our previous shows, as well as a link to a submission form 
Now that submission form uh, is for those of you who have show topics and ideas that you'd like to share, as well as questions. So if we can't get to your question here, go ahead and fill out that form and we'll do our very best to get back to you. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Lori. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Lauren. Thank you and good morning to everybody. And the link that Lauren is going to put into the chat, Space, pay special attention to it because I'm going to refer to it in a minute. Now, we got a great presentation for you today, but before I get started, I always like to go over a few things that I know may be on your mind, on your questions, especially ones that I'm experiencing during the week and working with some clients. So these are just a few little tidbits of information. Now, what's happening is I'm getting a lot of people say, okay, the idle loan, I have the idle loan. Now, when am I going to have to start making payments on that? You know there was many deferred payment plans. So Lauren's putting all this information in the chat as always, guys, so you can go grab it. I always give you the actual legal copy directly from the horse's mouth, as you hear me say, which is the government website. So you can see that where the deferred play payment plan is different, pending on when you got the EIDL loan. I have bolded the areas given the dates of when the idle loan was set up and what your deferred time period is. Also, I put some bold at the bottom. It's important to note that the interest will accrue. So this is for everybody that wants to know when am I going to start paying on my IDLE loan. I have a few other things about IDLE as that's been a hot topic with a lot of the clients today and this week. So once again, this is a repeat, guys, but some of you are new and I want you to be aware of it. You can ask for an idle increase. Idle increases are going to be allowed for up to two years as money is available. I can't say when money's going to be available, but let's say two years as long as money's available. Now, whether or not you can get an increase is dependent on your loan ability, the underwriting of the loan. So they will be reviewing financials, et cetera, again, but it still is available to be asked for. Now, for clarity, I am speaking of those who already have an idle loan and want to increase the amount. I am not, not speaking of new applications. New applications are closed, okay? Now, for those of you who do want to request an increase, if you have not, there's two ways to do it. You can log into the portal and you can request an increase. There's a button to request an increase. Or number two, you can email your request. In this slide, which once again is going into the chat, I've given you just some information about how to do that. Here is the email address to email to. Now, what I suggest you do is you complete a 4506T form. As a reminder, guys, this form allows the SBA to request a copy transcript of your tax returns from the IRS. And so if you ask for the increase and already have the form filled out, you're kind of speeding up the process. They're not going to write back and ask for the 4506. Now, if you say, oh, I submitted a 4506T prior, I don't need to again, that's not true. They have to have a 4506T every time they ask to review your file. I want you to think about it like if you were calling the bank and you asked the bank to review your bank account, what have you, they would say, can I access your account? And you would say, yes. If you called next week, they'd say, can I access your account? This 4506T is the same thing. I know people have submitted it five, six times during the correspondence. I also think it's a good idea to attach the copy of the 2019 tax returns because the IRS gets behind on providing the tax returns and that causes delay. Remember, the 4506T is a legal document. The filling out of the top must match your tax returns exactly. I mean, precisely, you wanna proofread this. If your company has a DBA, you must write the DBA. If it's social security, social security. If it's EIN, EIN. Please pull up your tax returns when you're filling out the 4506T. Double check yourself. So many applications get into trouble because they have not filled this out properly. 
I suggest you write in the subject line, request increase and include your loan application number. In the body copy, do the same and then state in the body copy that the attachments of the 4506T and the 2019 tax returns are attached, if and so they are. And for those who need the 4506T, here is the link to the IRS website to pull up the PDF of the 4506T. Once again, I always include the customer service to COVID-19 um, IDL, and for, she'll be putting this, Lauren will be putting this into the chat as well. What I have heard from clients, if you call early Saturday and Sunday, you get a better chance of speaking to them. Now, a little bit of words of encouragement and statements of persistency pays off. Let me explain. As you guys know, I work with these EIDL um, requests constantly, and I also work with the issues when someone is denied, the reconsiderations. And I've been through, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of them. And a lot of times when working with clients, they'll get emails from the SBA. The emails may not make sense. Sometimes they will wait and wait and wait. And I say, keep sending them emails, keep calling them, call them. And this one client just this morning, I mean, we've gone through this. I don't even know the number of one months, but I think it's probably been two or three months where he even got denied. I said, no, respond with this, respond with this, respond with this. Nope, call them, nope, call them, no call. Give them this form give him this form this morning he got the advance and his message was to me was thank you for the guidance and the encouragement to be persistent and i'm speaking of this because it's the encouragement to be persistent because i can't call them on your behalf you've got to call them so i know it's so frustrating but if your company really needs the increase just pick up the phone and stay on top of it really the summary stay on top of it now this other information, I have been in communication with many clients who need to either see about transferring the loan because they're selling the company. They may be unfortunately looking at closing the company. They want to know how that affects it. You know, obviously the EIDL loan is a 30 year time period. And so things within companies change. So I'm getting a lot of clients that have this question, who do I communicate? And there was no real good information about in this situation, who do you reach out to? So I went through my contacts at the SBDC and said, hey, we need to know, is there a special number? Who can they talk to? Who can they discuss these situations? And I got that information for you guys. So anyone that is in a situation, they have any IDL, they need to speak to a loan officer at the SBA because their company's being sold. They're, they're looking at needing to transfer the loan, any type of these situations, this is where you contact. And now this is a slide full of a lot of information. It's just things I'm experiencing a lot with people this week and I wanna throw it all in here. Okay, first topic, AB85. You took advantage of B85. That means you might have started an LLC in January 2021, which avoided the 800 franchise tax fee. I want you guys to know that anyone who starts an LLC in the state of California between January 1st, 2021 and before January 1st, 2024 has the elimination of the 800 franchise tax fee for the first taxable year. Now, I am not someone that encourages people to start LLCs unless there's a really good reason. In fact, I'm on the other side of the fence. And I like to tell people about 92% of the companies in the United States are sole props. So too many people jump into the corporation when they really shouldn't. So I'm not encouraging jumping into the corporation. I'm telling you this for two reasons. One is if you were looking at doing an LLC, you still have the opportunity to avoid this taxable um, for the first year. But I'm really bringing this up because now a lot of companies are getting into the second year and they have to remember you have to pay this tax. Don't miss it because if you do, your company Company can get suspended, it's penalties, it's not good, okay? So the second link here is how you go about paying the 800. Remember, it's gotta be paid the 15th day of the fourth month of your taxable year, which for those that were uh, eliminated the fee in 2021, it's gonna be due this year. So this is the link to the government webpage to tell you about how to pay that fee. I want people not to miss it. Now, Unfortunately, I'm also in communication with people that are having to close down the LLC they started. You know, they maybe thought it was going to turn out differently and now they're, you know, sitting with these fees and they don't want to, whatever, million different reasons. Each one is situational. 
first of all, if your company's still open, you still owe the 800. There's not a way to abate it because you didn't go through a full year. So you still have to pay the 800. But this next link is general information about closing a business in California. And the following link is what you have to do to dissolve an LLC. Remember, and this is the other thing I want to emphasize is when you dissolve an LLC or you, you dissolve an S corp, or you, you, you terminate any company incorporated in California, say you wanna go back to operating as a sole prop. People say, I wanna transition. You don't transition, you must close down the corporation and then you are by default operating as a sole prop or the same if you wanted to open as an S corp, you have to close down these companies, you don't transition. So that means the bank account attached to that EIN has to be closed. You have to sign documents that everything's been closed, all the debt's been paid. So in just a short form here, I'm telling you guys, just get it out of your head that you just transition. You got to stop one thing, close it down properly before you can open another. So there's some just basic information on that. Want to make an announcement, upcoming shows, February 2nd, that's next week. I'm going to have a special series where it's just me talking and it's going to be questions and answers, but it's also, what what do you want me to talk about? I've gotten a couple requests from people. Some people want to know about depreciation, what that means. Um, some people may want to know more, a little more about just dissolving the LLC. So please follow the link. That's why I said know where that link is. Follow the link that Lauren put. Give us a holler. Put it in the Q&A today so I'll see it. So next week's show is going to be just all Lori answering questions, giving information, giving advice. I've gotten a lot of requests to have a show where I do that. So I'm trying to have that once a month. And then February 9th, we're going to have a special guest that's going to tell a really fascinating story about how COVID caused the worst thing to happen in their company, or they perceived it, and it turned out to be a better direction for the company. So that's what's coming up in the upcoming show. But with no further ado, I'm very excited to um, introduce David Ronaldo to you today. Na David Ronaldo is the founder of College Zoom, and he's going to tell you about the company, what it does, and and his fascinating entrepreneurial journey. I have known David for, it just seems like a lifetime now. So this interview is going to be really fascinating as we go through all the different um, twists and turns that David experienced with his company. David, welcome. Come and introduce yourself to the um, audience today. And please just start out. David, this is the fun part. How did you come up with the idea? Where did you come up with the idea? Take us back to the beginning. All right. Well, first of all, I appreciate you, Lori, and also Lauren for coordinating this uh, webinar today and inviting me as an honored guest. It's truly an honor to be here and to recount my experience as an entrepreneur who greatly benefited from the SBDC for all of you out there who are listening. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited that all of you are taking advantage of people uh, who are making this kind of uh, small business mentoring available because uh, it's going to tremendously benefit your business as it has mine. Um, <clears throat> you know, one thing, Laura, I, didn't, uh, I forgot to ask you is what time frame should I frame my answer in? Because this is going back, what, like 13 seasons now? So, <laughs> you know, a lot of history. You know, why not just the very beginning and then bring us up to date? Because, you know, it's, it's always, and where I'm going with this, David, it's always interesting for people to hear where somebody came up with the idea. You know, they're like, I, I was in a bar drinking. I was sitting around chatting with friends. And David, you were where? <laughs> awesome. So I was a student at USC at the Marshall School of Business. And what happened was there was a four class series in the entrepreneurship major. And Lori Williams was, was on, uh, Lori Williams was my professor for class number four. Uh, but what was interesting was that in class number three, before I got to Lori, um, it was the, the least rigorous out of all the four. Um, it was a class where, you know, opposed to all the other classes where you would actually do things and analyze and put your brain to work, class number three uh, was where you just had people come and speak to you. And then you were like supposed to, through osmosis, you know, absorb their professional experiences. So one day the, the professor uh, and the department head pulled the rising class I was part of into a room. And it's like a coup. We, we, they, they said like, look, you know, we've been hearing about universities on the East Coast that are changing up their entrepreneurship curriculum so that students are now starting businesses as part of their class projects. And we think that'd be a much more valuable way to run class number three than what we had in the traditional curriculum. 
The only problem was the dean had not approved it yet. So if you guys take a class vote and the majority of you agree and we don't get in trouble for doing a bait and switch with the curriculum, then we'll run our program with this, you know, like a business startup class, even though technically on paper, it's going to be, you know, a, a guest, you know, lecture series. So everybody but one super senior opted in and the girl who was a super senior just wanted to graduate. So she opted out. <laughs> so they did like independent study for her. Um, but uh, but when, when I opted in, it was it was pretty wild because it was the first pilot class that we had in this manner where you would have like two or three weeks to come up with a business idea and then three weeks to run it and run and make a certain amount of revenue. And then three weeks to then like adjust your business plan and build and you know build out for the future. And then I think there was like a last part where you'd like figure out the scale and pitch to investors. So it was a very, very compact production schedule to run from like an eight week class. And what I remember from that class was <clears throat> just high drama. Um, it was like a reality TV show. People would come in and just have their like head in their lap. Um, one girl like revoked her own like evaluation for her team members because, you know, she was the accountant who just wanted to do numbers and all the other people like busted their butts. So when she found out that they wouldn't rank her who sat back as high as everyone else who pounded the pavement, uh, she took the evaluation back from the professor and was going to downgrade them and she was crying. It was horrible. But uh, but through that class, College Zoom was born. Um, and it now, was did born... you think at that point, David, that College Zoom was going to be the way you were going to learn, earn your income for what, how many years now? I'm lost track oh, of yeah. time. Going on 13 years. So, I was going to yeah. say, I knew it was over a decade. So, so basically, you know, you come up with this idea in college and then th by the time you got to class four, your idea was starting to come together, but it was still pretty preliminary. And then you, when you got out of college, you just kind of, in, okay, this is the way I'm going to describe it, David. You just kind of kept doing it. <laughs> well, yeah. And what was interesting was I didn't see myself as a college counselor. I wanted to go into like marketing or some kind of, a, you know, cool like brand promotions type of career for like Super Bowl ads and commercials. Um, but what happened was when I started this class project with my two teammates, you know, everyone was just desperate to pass the class because we were starting to see how hard it was going to be to make money in like a three week process. So people were coming with just safe ideas, right? Like sell, let's sell t-shirts for game day. Let's, you know, create like, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, shoes for sorority girls whose feet hurt when they go to parties. And the idea was that, um, you know, it, people were looking for a safe route. So I told my friends, I'm like, Hey, why don't we do a business that, people do when they're 40 and 50 years old, you know, so that even if we, you know, don't pass the, ch the challenge, we still get some kind of relevant real life experience. And college counseling was it because the three rules of the class were no rich uncles, you can't have any kind of startup investment from outside people. I think it was like 50 bucks was the max for the whole team. Um, it has to be doable within the semester. And then the last thing was it can't be a pre-existing idea. So, you know, college consulting was it because I was rejected from USC the first time I applied. So was my teammate. We figured, you know, uh, it's an unregulated industry. So here we go. <laughs> right? Now, so we can go fast forward for those of yeah. that are listening to understand when you say college cons consulting and stuff, what is it that college Zoom does in the two, three sentences so people can get their head around it as we continue to speak about it? Yeah, so I would say there's, there's a perception of what we do, and then there's what we actually do. I would say the perception of what we do is that we, and that's the source of why people hire us, is help students prepare for the college admissions process by preparing their applications and doing things extracurricularly or academically that help them meet the expectations of the universities. And what College Zoom has turned into um, was a, uh, it's basically a, America's biggest rite of passage, the admissions process. And it's kind of an interesting anthropological journey because what I found was that what our business actually does is not so much help people prepare applications, but we're literally shaping the whole identity of the student in an organic way so that their intellectualism and their achievements can rise and match the occasion of the university. So it's very much, you know, a transformative life-changing process that we've kind of found ourselves in. And I just kind of, you know, dig into that little thing about the whole, like, you know, we just do the class project because it was a college counseling thing, because I wasn't still serious about it. I thought, you know, I'm here for the experience. But once I started talking to people about the admissions process saying, hey, what's your project? People would go so crazy about the admissions process that I'd be like, I was shocked. You know, I was like, I know I was rejected, but I, I didn't have a, a, a negative visceral experience being rejected the way that other people did. Um, and so when I, you know, as they taught me in school, 
where there's pain, there's a lot of money. So I just kind of knew that based on how hysterical people were getting. You know, that's really, I brought really up, true. Yeah, whenever and, I brought up this know, topic. It goes back to who your real clients are being yeah. the parents and everybody knows the parent wants their kid in a certain school. And I think the other tidbit to add on that some people may not pick up is that, and you correct me, David, if I'm wrong on this, but when they look at it from admissions, when you say achievement, you're also saying what other activities is the person, who is the person? So it's not just about what was their academic achievement, but the well-rounded. And so you help the student as a high school student, I believe you correct everything I'm saying here, to know what to get engaged in to make that identity organically be created to work well for an admission situation. Yes. And even beyond that, we do things like, you know, shaping the way they approach leadership, helping them play politics in a positive way in high school. It's, it, it's very much like, I, I, it's hard to explain what, you know, all that we do, but I, I found that what, what it is that we're basically doing is helping. I tell parents this in, this, in the short version is we're helping kids not wait until college to start to become their fullest potential. And if we can help them envision what it's like to be at an Ivy League or a top 15 school and say, well, you can have that kind of freedom and growth right now in high school, because literally with this age of you know, technology, nothing's stopping you from getting access to people or resources. Right? Even right now, I'm, I'm, I'm watching an online course from Stanford University on biological psychology. You know, it's like there's really nothing stopping you from getting after what you want. Yeah. We, we dial up the growth that people expect to happen in college and we have it happen in high school. And that way what happens is the student can start to behave as a college kid in high school, which now gets them to rise up uh, at a much different arc of achievement than their peers. And, but that will naturally help them start to mirror to the college that they're, they're opting into this journey that the college is looking for people to opt into. And because they're actually authentically living it and going after it, their growth is matching the curve of growth that the college wants. So that's, in a, in a, yeah, it's in a nutshell, that's, that's how I describe it. Well, and you've got such a full understanding of the industry and everything going on now from your years of experience. Now, what I like to do, David, is I like to walk people back through what you experienced, I'm sure. And you know, those beginning days when you know, you're trying to figure out what to do, you're, you're challenged, you're having to use skills you don't know how to use. And one of the biggest questions that I ask every single person, because I know that the audience is wondering is they go, okay, I created something, it's a service, it's a product, it doesn't matter what, I got to sell it. I got to find a client. I got to find a customer. I don't feel comfortable being a salesperson. I don't feel comfortable in this aspect. And David, I know from my experience of you is you were out there and you were talking it up and talking it up and talking it up. And you guys can see David's very good at presenting, but you know, a lot of people aren't, and it wasn't your automatic for, you know, to, to go do that. So my question to you is when you start a new small business, you usually have to self-promote that company. You are the presenter. What words of advice can you give to people that you learned from the beginning of your presentations to now? If I was to say, what's five tidbits of wisdom that you learned if you look back at yourself presenting five years ago, 10 years ago to today, what did you learn? What can you share with the audience to help them in that same spot of starting out? Great. So what I'm going to, I'm going to layer this response because it, it happened in stages. So the first thing is, you know, I have no experience when I'm coming into the field as a, as a college, I think it was, yeah, college junior, right? Not even half, <laughs> halfway through my college experience. And so I didn't know anything about admissions besides my own personal experiences, applying the first time being rejected and applying the second time being admitted. And so not having any kind of background, we literally had to Google everything that people were asking us. And our price was basically like $75 for unlimited service because of the insecurity that we had, that we had to pass the, you know, the minimum threshold for revenue in three weeks, but also the fact that we didn't really know what the heck we were doing. So if we make it low enough pricing, then maybe you know it'll be reasonable with no credentials, right? So the first thing is, and this, you'll see this insecurity uh, power the business because you know I didn't earn a livable wage until halfway through year five, right? And then it, gradually the price rose as the, as, the, as the business evolved. But if we go back to when the price was cheap and the business was very crude, um, I was horribly insecure, and, I, and and it was not just me, but it was the whole class that was in that that class I just spoke about because I remember it was like week, it was like it was like four or five days before the deadline, you had to show, you know, how much money you made from your, your first challenge. 
And uh, the professor says, how many of you guys actually have customers in hand? And like uh, maybe two people in a class of 40 people actually had customers in hand. And, you know, the, the, we got five days to perform. And he said, that's interesting. Like, well, why don't you guys have customers in hand? And people started saying things like, well, I feel very uncomfortable going to people and pitching my product, you know, or my service. I just feel kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm a newbie because, you know, because I mean, these businesses didn't exist you know, uh, a week ago. <laughs> yeah. So, so he says, okay, I'm going to give you guys a paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift was wonderfully phenomenal because it gave everybody in the class confidence to then come back five days later and, 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 and close sales like crazy. So, um, he says, how many of you guys, you know, uh, you know, feel uh, unconfident, every hand in the room shoots up. And then he says, how many of you guys actually believe that your business is going to change people's lives. Again, every hand in the room shoots up, right? Even if they were selling like game day t-shirts and products that you think are just nominal, but they're going to help, you know, enhance the experience of being a, a fan on the sidelines. You know, people still felt that was going to enhance people's life experience in some way. And then he just simply said, if you think your product's so life-changing, why wouldn't you want to tell people about it? And then boom, 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 all the light bulbs go on. <laughs> right? Yeah. And now you know, the, the that's a really good story, you know, it, not to, to throw off oh. course at all, but there is a old, old, um, dead many years now, but he was a business consultant. I think it was called Ogmandito or something like that. I remember reading him when I was 20. He spoke about this salesperson and he was about to lose his job. He couldn't make any sales and he had kids and this whole story, right? And he was sitting in a Denny's. I think you used Denny's as an example at the time. Not only be Starbucks, but he was sitting in a Denny's and he was all, you know, upset. So he had to call on this customer and it was the last customer of the day. He waited to the last minute. Long story short, he goes in the parking lot. He's fumbling. He's not sure what to say. And he notices that a competitor truck pulls into the parking lot. When he sees that competitor truck, he acknowledges that this client is buying a attachment they don't need to buy. And when he realizes this, he fumbles with his briefcase because he can't get in fast enough to get the CEO to tell him how his product will really help and save his money, right? So it's your story. But what I love is they end the story is he says that customer never became the biggest customer. He had much larger customers. But that day, and this is what you're saying, David, is that day he sold to the biggest customer of his life. He sold to himself. Yeah. And that's what you're saying. The, the, the intelligence of that paradigm shift was getting you to sell yourself on what it is you were selling, if I can say it that way. And that was a great share. Please continue. Perfect. Thank you for that, Lori. So actually building on that, you remind me of another thing, because I'm, I'm getting to the, the, the stage advice that you gave me that really helped me hammer in. But I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to lead up to that, because that, that was that was the that was the ignition point. I don't even so, know what it is. So I'm excited. Uh, I'll tell you, it was during office hours. But before we get there, I'm going to I'm going to I want to put some pins down for the audience, because, um, you know, the, the natural thing that we were all insecure about, especially me in college Zoom was. You know, here we are, three college kids, and now we're going to compete against people who have been in this industry for years and have been former admissions officers. And they're charging, you know, good money, but that with that good money comes their prestige and experience. And so, you know, here we are thinking, like, who the heck is going to want to, um, you know, hire our service? And we didn't really know who it was because we, you know, yeah, the parents write the checks, but the problem is we don't know parents. We're a bunch of college kids. So we're, we're complete <laughs> outsiders to the, our market and our customer base. So there was this great um, story that Paul Orfla, the founder of Kinko's, gave when he came to speak to one of our classes. And he said that when he was at community college, you know, he was very transparent about how he has three like intellectual disabilities. It's like ADHD, processing challenges and disorders. Um, and the last one he told us was um, uh, dyslexia, right? And he says, look, I need you all to know this about me because, you know, my high school guidance counselor said that I would be a carpenter. And I'm stubborn. I'm Lebanese. I'm I'm gonna be a businessman. <laughs> you know, it's like that's what I do. And he says, you know, you, you have to just keep it simple because he says, you know, with the lack of you know smarts that people may think he would need to be a businessman, yet he became a billionaire through founding Kinkos and selling it to FedEx office. He said, I was at community college, you know, barely passing some classes, and walking down the street one day, I see a line of people coming outside of a storefront. And he said, where I remember this one lesson, which was, you know, where there's a line, there's demand. So he just looks in the window. It's a photocopy and print shop. So he thinks, okay, like, obviously I can make one right across the street because there's least space. I can 
co exactly copycat the business because where there's the demand, there's a need in the market. So literally he just copies the business across the street and now everybody knows Kinko's or FedEx office and nobody even knows the name of the business that he you know, basically copycatted across the street. So that was reassuring that when you see a lot of people who are already entrenched in the market and you're a newbie, it means that there are multiple opportunities for multiple winners. I mean, even if somebody in the audience wanted to get into college consulting, you might look at me and think, oh, I'm intimidated, you know? And, and yeah, we're kicking butt. We had the number one success rate in the country, but you have to remember we're number one in the country in the industry now, yet we entered the game way later than people who are still in it today, you know, who are, who are still in business. So, you know, you can be a new entrant. You can even join the same thing I'm in and there, there's enough room for multiple winners, right? Oh, Lauren, so, I got to get you to put multiple opportunities for multiple winners, quote by David in the yes. chat, okay? Can yeah. you put that one in for us, Lauren? That is a takeaway. Keep going, yeah. David. No, I mean, because, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, and, and actually there was a kid I was talking to on, um, about his passion project a couple of days ago. And he says, you know, I'm not sure what I want to do because I, in his passion project, he wants to create this app that helps athletes get recruited for college, right? But he's like, oh, but people are already doing that. But then I want something completely new and he gives me the idea. And I honestly, I don't remember what it was because it was a bad idea. Uh, and I told him, look, the reason why no one's done this thing before is because it's, <laughs> I don't think anyone needs this. You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of like, you know, like no one's going to do, like use this. Like it was high, try, trying to teach high school kids about like, you know, network programming like as if you're like a 40 year old it professional i was like no man no <laughs> you know so so the idea is that if you wait if you you know everyone's looking for a holy grail opportunity one that seemingly nobody's done before but usually if no one's done it before there's a good reason why and there's one that they get turned off by because too many people seem to be doing it but like i said multiple opportunities in the market everybody can win so don't let that deter you now once i got past that the next thing became well what do we sell? How do we sell it? And how much should we do it? So taking the same where there's a line, there's the man mentality. I went to our local community college, Santa Monica College, and we just went and looked for lines of students. We stood in line at the cafeteria. We stood in line at the registrar's office. We stood in line literally anywhere we could find one. And then finally someone said, hey, you should go to the transfer office because that's where people go to. to they, that's where people go to try to transfer to USC and UCLA. So we went there and perfect. That was our audience that was relevant because before people were kind of running away from these annoying kids, just asking them questions about transferring and they're just trying to eat lunch, right? So in the transfer office, we basically asked them three questions. And I, I it's technically just a fourth one in there uh, for a little psychological trick, but the three major questions for us to shape our business within like, again, a, a two or three week period to make, you know, the revenue and deliver it was, um, uh, it was, what do you want help with? That was number one, just asking the customer, what exactly do you want from a service that would be beneficial to you? And they laundry listed everything from financial aid help to picking a major, to picking classes, to writing their essays, to doing their activity sheets. And it was interesting because they, yeah, they wanted the moon, right? Great but question. Great question. Um, say it again, please. So Lauren can put it in oh. the chat. That's a great question for everybody to ask their customers. Yeah, just simply asking, like, what is it that you want help with? You know, what would you, what would you, what would you want a college counseling service to help you with? Uh, and they told us exactly what they were not getting from the transfer yeah. office at school. Perfect, perfect. I love that question. I just wanted to grab it. Keep perfect. going, David. The second question was, uh, how much would you pay for each of those, mm -hmm. you know, uh, offerings? Uh, and what we found was that college essays were the massive pain point. So therefore they put the highest value. Now, of course, the highest value is maybe like 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah. right? So, so, you know, it, the, 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 the values were not important in and of themselves, but what was important was that the distribution of the values showing that essays were the most important thing. And the course selection was maybe like, you know, five bucks. So they weren't, they weren't so important on that. But then what we did next was this tricky little thing was we said, how much do you think someone else would pay for the exact same services? Because oh, if it's them, that's interesting. Yeah, if it's, and that was my idea to ask that. So, <laughs> so if it's them, me asking you, how much would you pay? Well, I want deals and I like deals. So I pay low. I want a good deal, better than normal deal. If it's how much do you think someone else would pay? Well, you're going to subconsciously give me the actual rate that you feel is the fair market value that, you know, you would actually literally pay, right? Because um, you think that's a fair price. I so, love that, yeah, David. That that's a, a takeaway for me. I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> just quickly just do a little whoop, whoop, and you find out what the, what, I mean, and now again, it went maybe from like 75 bucks to 100 bucks, but still. <laughs> 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 you know? 
it, but still, it still, it still helps you kind of understand like, Hey, like this is where there's more perceived value than others. And then the last question of the, of the three was, uh, how would you want it delivered to you? Uh, you know, all virtual in-person one-on-one small group setting. And they just told us. So with those three questions, we effectively had a very makeshift business plan, which is what are we going to offer and prioritize in the short runway that we have? Um, next one up is, uh, what, you know, what, what should we price, you know, or what we think is a fair price. And then lastly, how are we going to deliver it? And, uh, and then, you know, what happened was we found four students who, you know, and, and you'll find that when, when you think of your customer, you always think of your perfect customer. And what I had to learn was, you know, people who are established and have money and, and, and want big results, they're not going to hire three kids out of college, you know, to, to help them with a life altering process. So even though I knew that was our customers one day who we had to work with now, that wasn't our customer back then because we were just not able to rise to the expectation that they had. So you know, that's so true. You know, as a consultant, I always said back when I was younger, my customers were those that just knew a little, li little less yeah, than I yeah, knew. No, right? no. <laughs> they couldn't know more. They had to know just a little less than I knew and be willing to pay for it. So I well, that. And that's the advice you gave me during office hours. Cause I told you once I was really scared. I said, Lori, I don't, you know, we had, you know, one season under our belt and now we're going for season number two. And we were just now in, in the business planning class that Lori was a professor in. That's where we kind of pick up the pieces and figure out what the hell did we just do and 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 how does this work going forward? And we're just like, well, the kids gone to amazing schools, but like now what? Um, you know, and you and I told you I'm 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 insecure, I'm nervous because now I'm gonna start going to my old high school. I'm gonna start to, you know, talk at classes, I'm gonna try to, you know, pound the pavement as like a you know, sell myself and my opportunity kind of guy, which was very uncomfortable. You know, I I like to joke now that I've been through so many years of business that it's not that I'm polished and professional. I'm just emotionally dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> All the scar tissue has just led me to be okay. You know, which is great as, as an admissions consultant, because you want someone who's like a cool co-pilot, just, you know, go right to the trade list and not be phased by it. But at the time I was a live wire, you know, uh, a, a very live wire. So you told me, Laura, you said, you know, um, all you have to know is this much more than the people you're helping. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. And, and, and then you added on that if you can help them this much more, it doesn't matter whether you can help them that inch or a mile, because you told me that there's a ceiling that they have above their head. And when they perceive there's a ceiling, that ceiling is now immovable. So anytime you can move that an inch or a mile, they just to them, it's still the same over the moon. And it's been amazing because of all the five-star reviews we've gotten on Yelp or, you know, Google review from year one, all the way to now people going back years when we were still an, an immature service, you know, still good, but, but, but not nearly as, you know, I, I would say that back then we were like a propeller engine for an airplane. And now we're like a, you know, F-35 stealth bomb. If you just strike and just blow up one building and save all the civilians around, you know, it's like, you know, now that we're like this amazing service, uh, the, the reviews are still the same. People are still amazed because they can't tell the difference between this inch that we helped them back in 2009. And now the miles we can do today, you know, to them, it's just, it's just more than they could have gotten. And so once I understood that, that the customers cannot perceive, you know, the same way that I could perceive being like a connoisseur you know, in the industry and being able to tell the difference myself um, that I had to, you know, adjust my expectation for who my customers were. So our first four customers were for international students from China uh, who wanted to transfer. And the reason why they liked us was because um, English was not their first language, but it was ours. You know, we are at USC, a school that they all want to go to. And most importantly, their only other offering was this shady guy named Eddie who writes the essays for the kids <laughs> and they all know their crap essays. And they said, well, we actually want to write it ourselves with coaching to have our own voice come through. And we say, that's wonderful. That's what we're going to help you do. So he said, great. These guys are $75 for unlimited help. You know, and Eddie's like, I don't remember what he was charging, but I think we were a little bit cheaper. Who knows? But <laughs> they, they went with us. And once they had a phenomenal results, then, you know, slowly but surely uh, the business started taking off. But I have to emphasize it. it took twice. You know, people would tell us that in college, it takes two times the amount of time and two times the investment to get your business off the ground. But for college, Zoom being a seasonal business where it, you can't just push and promote, you have to literally grow organically. It took, like I said, like five and a half years to earn a living wage. And then I, you know, I started the business when I was 20, I think halfway through 21. And I didn't move out from my mom's place until I was 27. 
Um, and now, you know, the hockey stick, the business has grown exponentially in its revenue every year. And I can, you know, own my own house now. And it's amazing as a millennial. But I think that how long I've had to starve it out is, is, is in a way an indication that the business literally had to kind of grow and raise its price in tandem with the evolution of our service to a point where we really had to earn it. And, you know, I think also it was the evolution of you. I remember, and I can't remember when this was, but it was, a, and I don't even remember what we talked about. It's funny that I even repeated what you were going to say I said, because I didn't even remember that I said that until you mentioned it. But the thing I remember is, and I, I, I kind of remember I was a, even a little bit forceful as I get when sometimes, you know, no, you got to, you know, I get that way. But I remember this conversation, it was pinnacle. And I was really telling you, David, you have got to get your system more streamlined you've got to charge more money you've got to stop giving away the shop you've got to get you know where you're actually making money you can't just keep playing you know the rest of your life with this right and I remember that and in the conversation you even called me back the next day and a couple days later it was one that continued and then the next time I spoke with you you had really streamlined you streamlined the message, you streamlined the marketing, you streamlined what you gave away at the first meeting, and then you went on to hiring people. So what I want to do, because you talked a lot about the, um, you know, getting confident, but when you streamlined, and then it started taking off, in my mind, you streamlined, you almost made a decision, you went back, you got clear, you got a, a larger audience, a higher price point, and then you started being able to hire touch on lessons in that time period. Yeah, so to, to frame that and, and then deep dive, College Zoom began, as I mentioned, $75 unlimited help, and then it became $75 an hour. No, I'm sorry, $75 unlimited help. And then at the end of that season, we asked our customers, how much would you pay for what you got now that you realize what it was worth? And they said $750. We're like, fantastic, we'll add a zero. And then every <laughs> year we'd ask, we'd ask our customers, what would you now pay? And so by doing that, we basically got the rate up from, you know, it, what became like uh, maybe $100 an hour. And now it's, it's at $350 an hour. Um, and, uh, and, and, it's, and it's a pretty wild, you know, like growth curve. But of course, I have to emphasize it's the, the evolution of the business uh, that really has justified that. But I have to say that the insecurity I have to, you know, dive into again, because when the business was still getting off its ground and, and Lori, we had that conversation you know, the reason why I was having these hour long free consultations with families was because, you know, I didn't work in an admissions office. Uh, you know, if I, I would joke and say, if I worked at Harvard, Yale, or even USC, we could have a 10 minute conversation. I just say, hey, take it or leave it. I'm an admissions officer, experienced person. And it would be a much easier sale, right? Because you would assume that if you have the pedigree, you must therefore understand that, you know, I, I'm an expert in what I do and I'll help your child. Now, What's ironic about College Zoom, and this gets right to the idea of like how I was able to streamline our message because it was a very, you know, we're, we're very much a black sheep in our industry in the case that we don't look or smell at all like, you know, you would expect a college admissions consultant to look like. And to explain what I mean by that, in our industry where people are charging like $10,000, $15,000, you know, per, per student, um, these are people who, you know, can tell prestige and, 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 and their pedigree. Now with us lacking that, all we ever had to go by was our success rate. And so part of the reason why we have the number one success rate in the country and we can kick butt of all these people who have been in, you know, Ivy League admissions offices is because we really know what we're doing. And then of course people wonder, well, how do you know what you're doing? You've never worked in an admissions office. And this person who has for the admissions office, <laughs> you know, you're saying they don't know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's an oxymoron. It doesn't seem to make sense, but you know, back when I was in college, I thought that by this time in my life, we would only be hiring admissions officers. But what I found was, as I mentioned in the beginning of our talk, because what we're really selling is an anthropological rite of passage that transforms students' minds and, and, and character, um, you don't learn that in an admissions office setting. And the kind of persuasive writing that we do is very counterintuitive because when people apply to college, for example, you would think that you have to write at a college level to get into a college when actuality, which is the flesh concave model, writing at a third to fifth grade writing level is actually what's better for your college application. And you think, what? But that's how Ernest Hemingway and Mark Twain would write for their audiences. So, you know, you can already see me start to say, like, how do I justify all these factoids? And you can, I can geek out for over an hour, which is what I used to do, you know, before Lori helped me out here. So what, what basically happened that helped me reel it in 
was getting very clear with Lori about, you know, what is it that the customers actually want? And Lori helped me understand that I shouldn't talk so much. Like uh, you said, uh, there was this quote you had, Lori, it was like, me thinks you protest too much or something, right? Yeah, I and, terribly quote Shakespeare, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And, um, uh, and, and, and what you told me was, I need to basically talk less and just let the customer talk more. And I thought that was very counterintuitive because look, I need to, I felt I need to educate my customer on why all these, all these experts, you know, are not as uh, on point as they think. But what she explained, what Lori explained was that by the time that someone already, you know, puts a call into your kind of a business, which does not compete on price competition, which, you know, is a pretty high, high investment for a lot of families. Um, they've already kind of sold themselves and have done the research, you know, uh, before placing that call. And so therefore, they're looking more for a validation that you have what they want. They're not looking for a whole like, you know, educational experience. And so I, you know, I, I didn't trust it until we got to the point where we were pretty much full with capacity. And I just had to find a way to not even take on customers. I was like, you know what? No. <laughs> And, and I started saying, oh, you know, because it was such a riveting thing for me emotionally to try to ditch my, my you know, because that, that's what got me to where I was at the time, right? Like this, these hour long consultations. I'm like, no, I don't want to let that go. What if what the business starts to fail? Well, once we got busy enough where I was working like a slave and, and I had no, you know, I had no time for myself. I thought, what have I got to lose? It's not going to matter if one or two customers don't sign up. So, so I'll try it out. So I would have these like 15, 20 minute cons consultations. And I would, in my mind, not even tell them anything. And then they would sign up. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, when I, like that. Said to, I, yeah. I said to entrepreneurs all the time, I said, you know, be it this right, be it wrong, be it pleasant to hear, whatever. But as you grow, if you continue to grow, you will end up needing to fire probably 80% of your first customers because your business model and pricing model may not be what you can continue with and you have to evolve and that, that's so true. But it, it's it's absolutely correct. I mean, a lot of times we just, and I always say me thinks you protest too much. We can actually sell ourselves out of the sale by talking too much to convince somebody on something they already believe and want to purchase. And then they're like, well, why are you trying to convince me? Maybe there's a catch. It gives them maybe they're a catch. Excellent points. So David, now I'm going to bring you to a structure question. Okay. I hear this a lot from new entrepreneurs, especially ones that, you know, start in their early years. And it's been one of those things that you hear on all of the entrepreneurial shows. And in my personal opinion, I think that it's confused and caused more problems. And it says, get yourself a team, give them stock in the company, grow it that way, whoever helps you. And I've um, expressed to you on several times and many people is they don't understand that if you distribute stock, you are in essence marrying somebody and there is legal and tax ramifications of that relationship and different aspects. And so I know that comes up a lot. David, what would you say as an entrepreneur that you've experienced with how to, how to bring people in to help you, be it an intern, be it a stock, be it employee, give us some tidbits on that. Yeah, so I'll take you guys through the very like first structure of the business, which was as a general partnership back as a class. You know, we were not an LLC, we were not an S Corp or anything like that. We were literally just um, three students partnering in the general partnership. So, you know, third ownership of the business. Now, the business became so labor intensive that me being the only one who was really passionate about it, <laughs> my two partners were very happy to run out and say, okay, I'm going to go make a living. <laughs> Peace, you know? <laughs> so, so, my, so, you know, you'd be surprised that when the business gets going, everyone would want, you know, it's like people look at college and nothing. Oh my God, I would love to be a part owner. But it's like, you know, uh, every opportunity where I even gave stock to people uh, <laughs> ended up getting it all back. You, you don't, you don't realize how, how murderous, and I want to use the word murderous, uh, the life of an entrepreneur could be, which is partially why, you know, entrepreneurs have like the highest divorce rate of, of, of any kind of profession. So year one, three partners, by year three, just me. Um, I had my first employee in year six, uh, and I gave her 10% uh, stock in the company. Um, she got burnt out by it and then ended up leaving and I bought it back, <laughs> you know, cause she, cause when you're a stock owner, you also have responsibilities, you know, now technically 
my, my, my point to what Lori just said was that when you give away stock, not only are you marrying them, but if they leave the company and it's a small business, you, you know, they have voting shares and they can make decisions. And she was like, you know what? I'm out, you know, uh, I want to move on, you know, and travel. I want to do things in different industries. Uh, I don't want to be reeled into like a shareholder meeting or anything like that and have to, you know, keep on engaging with the business that I'm, you know, setting in my, in my past. So she sold it right back to me once she was out. Uh, Which I gave... means cash when you necessarily don't have that cash. Exactly. You suddenly have to, throw... I wanted to make sure everybody got that because I remember you, you had to, you know, basically, you know, send out your bank account a bit to, to make that okay again. Yeah. I mean, today I could like, you know, pay it and not even blink twice, but back then I was like, Oh yeah, no, like you right. know, it's a different situation. Um, I gave 4% stock to a former professor of mine to be an advisor. Um, and recently he gave it right back, you know, luckily a good natured guy. And he said, you know, let's be honest. I didn't help as much as we originally envisioned I would help. And so he just gifted it right back to me. Um, which was cool. Uh, I don't think that always happens. <laughs> no, no. The, the, yeah, the hidden context was that his son uh, he had a business that made multi millions of dollars. So he had like a $20 million payout. So for him, this little stock in college Zoom was like, eh, I don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you can't always count on your mentors, yeah. you know, making their own payout and then not really caring about your yeah. stock anymore, right? Because that, that was completely, that, that, that did have a factor. Um, and now I'm here's the number one sole owner of college Zoom. And the way I'm going to structure, because now I have three full-time employees, is I told them I want them all making six figures within three years. And then by year four and beyond, I'm, I'm going to have a profit sharing plan. And, and the reason being for profit sharing rather than, um, you know, stock is because should one of them leave for any reason, um, I'm going to need to redistribute the revenue and, and proceeds to incentivize the next generation of people who work in this business. And especially with us being a service-based business where, you know, the business is people, you know, um, as, as technology enabled as we are, it really is people. And already with my three full-time employees, you know, one being a parent, um, one, you know, having a girlfriend, another one who really is able to work and burn in midnight oil like I used to be, I could immediately see that my employees have different life obligations, responsibilities that will, in a way, you know, limit or enable them to invest certain amounts of time into the business. And so now I'm already realizing that within the profit sharing plan, there has to be mechanisms to fairly distribute the proceeds to people who are going to be the yeah. more entrepreneurial or, you know, the more traditional employees and they're all valuable members of the team. But I now know that not having this thing where everyone has this vote because you'll find that the more votes people have, the more that they'll just kind of, you know, perceive things through their own life experience and all my employees as they become full-timers, you know, they're all like, man, I can't believe how much you work. And I'm like, well, I'm still shielding you. So <laughs> You really, yeah. you really don't know, yeah. <laughs> but already yeah. you're like asking for breath. And I'm like, well, this is, I just, I just, you know, turn on the, the leak of the faucet. So, you know, it's um so very often, you know, the, the, it, it's not until people may step into the full role, they really, really understand what sacrifices you're making, you know, for basically a decade of my life. I, I, my, my little joke that I always tell people is that I, I'm a One Direction fan. I'm not ashamed. You know, I like the boy bands. Uh, and I always wanted to go to a One Direction concert. But with this business, I put my head down. Those years are a blur. By the time I had the money to actually afford whatever the hell they were charging for tickets, well, they disbanded. And now they're not getting back together. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, so having learned from that experience, that's why I'm, I'm actually now pulling back on business, you know, to have family experiences and, 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 and limit what we take on. I'll tell you one thing that relates to your previous question, Lori, because this past season, we had a witness for, for the first time in our history. And I would just tell people, no, I'm sorry, we can't take you on. And what I didn't anticipate, because now I'm not doing any consultations. I'm just saying, no, I'm sorry. You know, we literally have no capacity. And people were going nuts. They were saying, I'll just pay you sight unseen. I'm like, like, what? You, 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 like you're going to charge like $4,500 sight unseen for a package I've known you ever talked to. And, and they were literally selling themselves off of our Yelp reviews, off of our things on our website. And, and a couple of people actually did that because as we get had kids finish up early the season, some people were just literally just paying us to, to sign up and people who I've never even talked to. Now, I, I don't I'm not making that a practice because, you know, we it really does have to be a match. But from what they would send me, I'd be like, OK, you know, I can see it's pretty, you know, a straightforward case. I don't see any like thing in the GPA that would cause, you know, uh, a need for more counseling than we have the staffing to provide so if it's very straightforward we can do it boom done and being able to close you know sales of a big magnitude with literally no consultation that 
that for me was the point where I was like, okay, I told the team, you know what, all of our financial futures are secure. <laughs> you know, like, wow. We can do that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think we're going to be okay. I used to yeah. be up at night wondering what's going to happen to the business and are we going to survive with the pandemic? And now that this has happened, I'm like, you know what? No, I think we, we are, we are okay. And, and you're all going to retire with call and zoom, I hope. So there's a future for all of you guys. Well, you know, David, I am just so amazed and impressed with your steadfast. I know how much you worked. You worked constantly. Your story was an excellent story. Thanks for sharing. How about three takeaways, whether you want them to be what you should do, shouldn't do, or emotional, you do it. Three takeaways to everybody out there listening. Yeah, so uh, I think the best takeaways are when you're beginning, because if you look at someone who's in position like I am right now, it's easy to be intimidated and think, how can I get there? And it's like, you know, 13 seasons of just not work, not stopping and working. Yeah, you know, so way past maybe 10,000 hours for the expertise I had to amass. So if you go back to how do you go from being a nobody showing up in an industry that's already saturated, like a, like a Starbucks on every corner and being a new entrant, the very first thing I would encourage everybody to understand is that people always ask, what do I have to know to get started? And I would flip that and I would tell them, ask your, you know, not even ask yourself, but just realize <laughs> how much you don't have to know about anything to even get started. Cause just having the cojones to get yourself out there, um, you know, is going to already make you different compared to people who won't even try and they'll be stuck in an analysis paralysis forever. So number one, realize you don't really have to know almost anything to get started, you know, just, 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 just make the move and then you'll figure out as you go. Um, Takeaway number two is that you need to have good mentors because me, myself, you know, for years, I kept on telling myself that it's still a class project because that's the only way I could develop the confidence to go out and sell people as the price rose. Because now, even though the price at the time, I thought, oh, these are, it's going to be too high, you know, it's going to scare customers away in year three and four. Um, had I not had mentors like Lori who would help me get off of this, it's still a class project because if it's still a class project, you'll keep on undervaluing yourself and help me mature and grow into the emotional confidence of, you know, this is a real business and I do add real value and change lives. Then, uh, I would have been like the elephant who, you know, is a massive hulking beast, but yet still feels like I have the internals of a mouse because I was, you know, brought up in chains. So, and then the last thing I would say is probably the number three takeaway is that, um, hmm, this is probably a good one, but I would probably say, just ask those three questions of your customers and let your, let your customers build out your ideal version of the business. Because as an entrepreneur, people think that you have to have this creative vision. And I, I don't consider myself too much of a creative person like Paul Orpola. I just basically first want to become competent and just copy what other people were doing just to know the foundation. And once I got there and I thought, you know, what people are doing just it's kind of bullshit you know i can do something much better once i had that confidence to know like oh this is this is this is kind of like this admissions officer is kind of just, just just full of crap uh you know then i i could really find a way to to find my niche and develop a competitive edge but had i tried to perceive what that edge would be from day one not knowing anything it would have been too intimidating to get started but first get competent and once you become competent, you'll be at a much better vantage point on the chessboard to make your next move. And then now, you know, people always email me saying, I, I want to reach out to your company because you guys are the most innovative and you're, you're saying you're so uniquely different from anything that's out there. But literally, it's always been because we put the customers first. We always ask them, what's your ideal version of a business in this industry? Now, of course, some things they said were just, you know, just infeasible, but we always use our expertise to figure out how do we get closer to there. And when they say they want a certain result, you know, they're not really saying I want an anthropological rite of passage that will help me become a, a, an adult in a very mature way. But, you know, literally we, we've gone there because that's that's what we found is a the process they have to go through to get the result they want. So, you know, you'll end up seeing these underlying issues and subtext and reading between the lines of the customer, but that comes from your familiarity. So just know you can get started without knowing as much as you think you need to know. And as you go, you'll start to develop that subtext and your mentors will help you weather through it. Awesome information. Thank you so much, David. For anybody who wants to get in touch with you, um, where what can we tell them? How do they get in touch with you? I'm 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 fire capacity. I can't, I can't. So we're still tur turning away customers now. But if you okay. have quick questions, you can just shoot me an email at my David at collegezoom.com and I'll uh, I'm just going to warn, I'm going to type very fast. I'm already up to like two o'clock in the morning. It used to be five and six o'clock in the morning, but I'm already up at two o'clock in the morning doing email. So I'm just going to go quick, quick, boom, 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 and knock it out. Uh, but that would be a way. 
David is an example of success, guys. And thank you for sharing the wisdom. Lauren, uh, back to you. I'm speechless. This was one of those interviews that we could play in an entrepreneur class. We could play in a business class. We could play in so many different arenas. And it has just one tidbit after another. Thank you so much, David. Back to you, Lauren. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you both. David, that was amazing. All the information, just how candid you were. Thank you so much. I'm seeing in a chat, so many people are so grateful. Um, anyone who joined us today is incredibly grateful to you both, actually. Lori for facilitating and then David just, again, for being so candid and being so real. Thank you. To all of you who joined us today, thank you for our frequent flyers. Thank you so much for joining us yet again. And for those of you who are new, please know that we appreciate you being with us and can't wait to have you with us next week. Tune in for Small Biz Talk, solutions for your small business every Wednesday at 10 a.m. And, and guys, feel free to reach out to Lauren in the middle of the week. Like I said, next week, we're gonna have an open forum. I'm sure it'll have a mixture of EIDL, some tax, some finance, Whatever's on your mind, guys, you tell me anything that you want me to touch base on, let me know. But I'm going to be back with all these different issues that I know everybody's um, worrying about or addressing right now based on what I'm hearing from the clients. Lauren? I am also uh, re-including our contacts. So please, if you have any questions or if you would like to submit topics or questions for next week, like Lori mentioned, I've included a link there. And then you'll also see a link to our previous recordings. And please note that everyone who has attended today, as well as in the past, a recap email will be going out later this week with uh, copies of the slides, as well as the links to each of our recordings. Um, again, thank you to you, David. Um, congratulations on all the work and successes and continued successes to you and College Zoom. And then for you, Lori, I look forward to seeing your face next week. Thank you. As to you. Thanks again, David. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Take care.